So what's it like coming back to New York? No, it's great. I mean, it's home in so many ways, even if I'm not staying at my parents' place because they're over on the other side of the world babysitting or, um, but you know, there's just the characteristics, the buildings, the, just the physical layout, how imposing everything is, but how intimate, you know, small Susan neighborhoods are. It's pretty New York, you know, so uh, it's great to come back and Do you come see back friends. here and feel like I'm, I'm still a New Yorker, or do you come back here and say, I'm a global citizen? It's sort of once a New Yorker, always a New Yorker, is also just sort of once an American, always an American, you know, and, uh, you know, this is one of the places that I consider home, you know, of course, and perhaps maybe even the most significant next to Singapore. But obviously Singapore is replacing New York to some degree. But again, it's not either or. I, I think of identity as cumulative and I think of, you know, territory and uh, as cumulative. You know, I identify with India, identify with Dubai. When I land in Dubai, I really, I spent my childhood there. I know everything about it, you know, and uh, it is a very natural place for me to be. I know that there are lots of people who don't know anything about it, who fear it and disparage it. I'm well aware, but their conversations are irrelevant to me because I know it, you know. And uh, London, same thing. Berlin, for sure. Very much a place I think of as home. Do New York, without a doubt. Because of the fact that you are like this global citizen, that perhaps the way you see things is... is uh, is not through that narrow lens, in a sense, that we find so much in the West? It, if, the, if I was the kind of stereotype of what one means when one says a global citizen, meaning having more of a preference for a kind of, you know, superficial sense of choice about where one is but never being too deep, then that would be true. But I'm, in a way, the opposite approach to being a global citizen because I am a New Yorker. I do know everything about American life. You know, I study it. You know, I grew up in it. And the same thing is true of India. So I'm a global citizen as a composite of those things, not as a superficial, you know, layering, just creaming off the top of those things. One of the things I really liked about the book is that you stitched together so much you, you take this point and that point and all these things that people see kind of separately. What goes into the process? When do you say, hey, you know, I think I'm going to write this book. I think this would be a fascinating thing to look at. Uh, walk us through the whole process. So that observation is sort of what has motivated every book I've ever done. So the first book, Second World Empires and Influence in the New Global Order, was meant to reconcile these literatures that seem so detached from each other. There was a literature in the 90s and 2000s about America, the hyperpower. Then there was a set of books on how Europe is the regulatory and social democratic role model for the world. And then there was a literature about the rise of China. So you had in geopolitics, which is a very global and holistic kind of discipline, you had three completely independent sets of ideas that had no conversation with each other. But we live on the same planet Earth. How could each, how could they all be right? and they either are all right or they're all incomplete. And so my view was I have to write a book that reconciles the very valid things that people were saying about American power, the valid things that people were saying about Europe, and the valid things that people are saying about the rise of China, but in one story because we live in the same world. And so it's the same with everything else. You've got the people writing about Asia who are only China-centric, you have the people talking about India and the resurgence of, uh, you know, Japan and, uh, you know, the rise of ASEAN as an economic club. Uh, and then you have the books about Asia that are actually just about how America still needs to keep the peace. So you have three contrasting literatures and approaches and attitudes and belief systems about Asia that, again, why are they not in the same book? How can you write a book about Asia that is so utterly incomplete by ignoring the two other major approaches to Asia? So that's the itch that I needed to scratch. And every time I do a book, it's sort of, there's a big itch here, which is to say a big gap that people aren't filling. And with this book, it's almost so obvious how big the hole was because you have a whole set of books, you know, pre prevalent today that are purport to be about Asia, but still really just focus on, you know, greater China, which is again, the right. anchor of Asia, but there are another three and a half billion Asians. 
Earlier in the show, we learned how Asia is playing a defining role laying the groundwork for the future through national, cultural, and economic exchanges. Playing a key role in facilitating this exchange comes down to the infrastructure crisscrossing the continent. Just as it pioneered the Silk Road, today Asia is home to the largest highway, rail, and maritime networks on the planet. Countries across the continent are continuing to expand their infrastructure networks, expanding on historic routes, or creating entirely new ones. Leading the charge is China through its Belt and Road Initiative. Announced in 2013, the Belt and Road seeks to expand existing transportation routes along the ancient Silk Road and creating new corridors connecting China and 65 other countries. These routes span nearly the entire Asian continent and even extend to Europe. Though this project is still in its early stages, some of the corridors have already been completed. Most notably, the new Eurasian Land Bridge, a rail line connecting 35 Chinese cities with 34 European cities, including London. May of 2017, and, and right. I was in Beijing for it, uh, oh, yeah. and you say it's a cornerstone moment. Yes. And of course, it's the Belt and Road Initiative Summit, yes. bringing all these countries together. Talk to me why you see that as so important. Mm -hmm. I think that you know we've used this phrase Asian century or forecasted its emergence from the 18th century, and now it's finally happening. But people wouldn't necessarily put a date on it. If you think about the quarter century since the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, in Western thinking, that's kind of a void. You know, it's sort of the unipolar moment of the United States, but that unipolarity is waning, but no one really knows what comes next. And But people are were hesitant to actually call it the Asian century. The Belt and Road Summit in April of 2017, to me, is very significant because it was the culmination of a process conceived in Asia by Asian leaders for Asians and implemented by Asian powers, right? Principally China, but immediately convening all of the others. The speeches early on before that summit that Xi Jinping gave about it were in places like Kazakhstan, for example, right? So the end, of course, Russia has been a close collaborator with China in some of these areas around infrastructure. So to me, this is pan-Asian, again, driven by China, but now everyone is involved. The membership in the Belt and Road Initiative has grown uh, to include many more countries. The Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which translates some of that vision into, into finance, is probably the fastest growing multilateral organization in history. So I tend to think of this as a collective uh, sort of thing. And again, Asian-founded, Asian-led, Asian-financed, Asian-run. In 2016, China launched the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank with 100 billion U.S. dollars in pledged capital. To date, 87 countries have signed on with the bank. Projects have ranged from building a national highway in Pakistan to planting more flood-resistant cities in the Philippines to rehabilitating a hydropower plant in Tajikistan. The bank has been dubbed China's World Bank. We have data going back 200, 250 years showing that when countries invest in infrastructure, that is how you grow. You cannot grow without it. It's kind of obvious, obviously, roads, railways, power supply. When foreign investors go into an emerging market or a frontier market, a developing country, surveys show that the number one thing they're looking for isn't necessarily you know, rule of law or low corruption or an educated workforce. Of course, those things are really important. Do you know what they're looking for? A stable electricity supply. A stable electricity supply is the number one thing that convinces companies, yeah, let's go and invest there. Do you know how many people don't have a stable electricity supply in Asia? It's a couple of billion people, right? So we have to do this. It can be improved. It's going to be improved. It's, it's, it's morphing and evolving every day, the Belt and Road Initiative, and it's definitely going in the right direction. In 2014, the entire country of Bangladesh was plunged into darkness after a day-long power outage. Currently, one in three Bangladeshis are not connected to the power grid. Bangladesh signed on to be a member of Belt and Road in 2016 and has received the largest amount of Belt and Road funding for new infrastructure after Pakistan. With its location between South and Southeast Asia, Bangladesh plays an important role along new trade routes. 
And the interesting thing about what happened in China is once the economy came up, it, it lifted so many people out of poverty. One of the points you make is about the brilliance of the Belt and Road Initiative. China's got a lot of steel. Steel is needed for infrastructure. Infrastructure is needed in a lot of these countries that are developing. So it all kind of wraps itself together rather neatly, does it? It does. And again, I wanted to emphasize that this is the culmination of the past 30 years of Asians building complementarities. So again, Arabs and Persians have the oil and the gas. Chinese and Koreans and Japanese need it, right? That was called what we call the energy super cycle, and that kicked off in the 1990s through the 2000s and to today. Now, fast forward to the present, and China has the steel, China has the construction companies, and other countries of Asia, again, there's five billion people in the Asian mega region. Most of them live in post-colonial or post-Soviet countries, former British colonies or former Soviet republics. Their populations have tripled since the end of World War II. And there has been a market failure, that would be the neutral economic term, you know, I would call it a crisis of the lack of quality infrastructure for many of these five billion people. Now China has done an amazing job of delivering that infrastructure for its own population of 1.4, 1.5 billion people, but what about the rest? The World Bank and other entities abandoned infrastructure finance in the 1960s. Again, while these countries were poor and independent, and their populations were growing. So in a way, what I say about Belt and Road is if it did not exist, you would have to invent it. You must bridge that market failure for infrastructure services, uh, steel, the finance, and Belt and Road wraps that all into one. Parag believes future economic hubs will be centered on mega cities, and these will become increasingly connected through new roads, railways, and airports. So last time we talked, it was 2016, you had a book out at that time where you talked about uh, how nation states in the future may not be as important as hubs. And one of the hubs you talked about was Chicago, Toronto, Detroit, yes. and yeah. if that hub existed, right. it could actually bring about a renaissance in Detroit. And the reason why I bring that up is because obviously the United States did not embrace that right. kind of philosophy. They right. went with Donald Trump who wants to erect a wall, but has Asia adopted your kind of vision of the future, that blueprint? Oh, that's a fantastic question. I mean, so the, the argument there was not just about specific hubs, it was the connections between the hubs. And what we're starting to see happen in Asia is that not only, despite the states being quite powerful, the cities and being the center of those economies, they are forging these connections across them. Belt and Road, for example, is obviously uh, bringing that to life in many ways with the trade corridors that are being defined and connecting ur major urban centers and populations together. So yes, Asia, despite the nationalism that exists across the region, what you clearly see is borders coming down, more migration across Asian countries than ever before, huge amounts of infrastructure being invested domestically and across borders. So yes, in many ways, and this is what the book is all about, is the rise of the Asian system, right? In which Asians have come to have more dealings with each other than they do with the rest of the world. The resurrection of the ancient Silk Roads and so forth. And all of that has to physically be done. It's not just an idea. It rests on this physical connectivity between cities that you're talking about. Asia's potential has made it a new promised land, an economic frontier. It's not just Asians moving around Asia. According to the UN, 7 million people migrated from Europe to Asia in 2017. All over the region, I'm seeing young Americans, young Germans, young French, young Brits who are saying, I've got a great startup idea. And yeah, I've raised some money in, um, you know, in the US or you know, I've got a you know, angel investor in London, and I definitely picked up these technology skills while I was studying at Cambridge or Stanford, but I want to apply it to Asia. And they're coming on one-way tickets, right? They have no reason or intention or desire to go back because, you know, why work and slog on Wall Street, you know, for millions when you can actually deploy an idea that'll make you a billionaire in Asia? And that's the kind of ambition that we're seeing. So the play on words that I like to use is, you know, Americans are making Asia great again. <laughs> um, and it's this phenomenon of repatriation, uh, the term that I coined for it. As someone, I grew up as an Asian American, right? That's what I was called. And now I think of myself as an American Asian because I'm an American who's gone back to Asia. And rather than the immigrant kid who's struggling to fit in in 
America. I'm the repatriated American who wants to fit in in Asia. As we near the end of our conversation, I realize that the future isn't just Asian. What Parag is really talking about is this. The future is global. My kids who are young are growing up very much as global kids. Singapore is a global city. It's one of the most ethnically, you know, racially, uh, religiously diverse places in the world. People have multiple identities and they don't think that's abnormal. And that's another example of a different generational view of the world. Our parents or grandparents' generation fought wars against their neighbors, right? The notion of national identity is strong and I don't expect them to simply cast that aside. But in a very passive way almost, younger kids growing up today are growing up with multiple identities based on where they live, where their parents come from, what languages they learn in school, where they travel to, where their pen pals are, through the internet and Facebook and so forth. So let's accept, again, let's see the world from their point of view. And what you see is a world where identity is layered. It's not bordered. Fantastic. Prague, always a pleasure. Thanks so much. Thank you.